This is ECE 341 random processes. This will be lecture eight, part one. I'd like to just go ahead and uh, make this lecture uh, about continuing our examples previously. I'm working with some counting and other um, examples that illustrate a lot of the concepts that we've seen in chapters one and two. This lecture will really help us uh, complete out chapter two so we can move on into the basic topic of discrete random variables. So continuing our examples from last time, uh, this would be the eighth example in that sequence. I'd like to think of an entrance examination taken at a university, for example. Uh, let's uh, make a few assumptions in here. We'll assume in this particular case that a thousand students took a math entrance exam, and there were three separately graded sections. There's a basic section, there's an intermediate section, and then there's an advanced section, and the students would get a score at each one of those. The past numbers for those sections out of that thousand students, um, or maybe the ones who passed multiple exams, um, turned out something like this. 824 students passed the, passed the basic exam, 527 passed the intermediate, 134 passed the advanced, um, 400 passed both the basic and the intermediate, um, 108 passed both the basic and advanced, and 117 passed both the intermediate and the advanced. And then 92 students uh, were able to pass all three, so they passed the basic, intermediate, and advanced. To gain admission to the university, you have to pass one of the three exams. You have to pass the basic, intermediate, or advanced. And then we'll give some additional information that if you pass the basic um, math exam, you'd be given provisional admission into the university. If you pass basic and intermediate um, together, you'd get normal admission. And that if you passed all three, basic, intermediate, and advanced, there's some form of scholarship that would be provided to you for that exceptional math skill. We're going to go ahead and um, try to figure out a few related um, numbers that come out of this. Um, any other admission, by the way, that wasn't a provisional, normal, or scholarship um, where you had a pass would require remedial training, and if you didn't pass any of them, uh, you would just be denied admission. So I'm going to go ahead and take a look at five different things here. I'd like to know how many people were denied admission, how many were given provisional admissions, how many had normal admissions, how many had scholarships, and how many required some form of remediation. These would all be um, numbers or uh, quantities that an admissions department would be interested in. You need to know how many students are, are getting a scholarship so you know how much uh, money you're going to have to set in reserve to, to meet those scholarship uh, obligations. For me in this one, um, while it has numbers and we can think of it in an accounting sense, I really think that, again, pictures can help us visualize and manage the data. And I've started it in this particular case by writing um, a Venn-like diagram that shows our universe. That's the thousand people who are taking the exam. And it's shown the three exam uh, uh, pieces in there, the basic, intermediate, and advanced components. And we know that there's some possibility of overlap in there. And all I'm going to try to do is I'm going to start trying to do some management of information by looking at what was given and using that given information to see if I could um, add some numbers to this Venn diagram. So let's go back up here onto the top and take a look at some of this information. So for example, it says that 92 people, and I'm going to use a highlighter here to let me know that I've accounted for certain information, 92 people passed the basic, intermediate, and advanced. That's something that's very specific on this. That's the intersection of all three, basic, intermediate, and advanced, and that has 92 students. So I'm going to go ahead and put in a 92 in there, and that gets me started in trying to manage uh, this information. I might go down and try to figure out um, something else. Uh, I'm going to go in here and I'm going to look at, for example, the fact that basic and advanced was covered by 108 people. So let's go ahead and use that as well. So we know basic and advanced. So we had basic and advanced, right, was equal to 108. And if I take a look at the basic and advanced, the intersection of those two, Right? That includes also the students who also pass that inter intermediate part, um, and that's the 92 that's in there. So I have 108 there. Um, there is the portion of basic and advanced that did not include the intermediate part, um, and so 108 minus 92 would give me that. So if I was looking, for example, for basic and advanced and not the intermediate, right? I know it's going to be that 108 minus 92, and that Venn diagram certainly helps me see that in this particular case. So in this particular um, example, if I take 108 minus 92, that's 16, so I can put in here 16 for that other portion. 
Now, if I wanted to, I could just look at this idea that basic and advanced, for example, being 108, I can show where that is on the Venn just very quickly, right? It's that football shape. And if I add the two numbers in there, um, the two numbers that are shown are disjoint events, 92 and, and 16 is 108. So that would be one way I could get that. I'll go ahead and erase that out of there so we don't uh, confuse it as we move on. Okay, so let's use um, some more information that we found up here. We also know that intermediate, for example, and advanced is 117. So if I come down here and I look at intermediate and advanced, I say intermediate and advanced, right, was equal to 117, something along those lines. So I know that intermediate and advanced and not the basic, right, should be equal to that 117 minus 92 here again. So if I go ahead and do that, that's a total of 25 in this case. So I can go ahead and mark that as well in there. So from that bit of information, I was able to get the 25. I'm going to continue in here. And by the way, if I take a look at this uh, Venn diagram, the areas that have kind of their own unique space, um, there's a total of what? If I go ahead and count these in here real quick, there's this outside area. That's one of them, two of them, three, four, right, five, six, seven, eight. There's eight areas going on in there. And so um, we're going to be trying to fill in all eight of those areas. Let me go ahead and get rid of those numbers just really quickly. So um, we've gotten three of them so far. If I continue in this, I'm going to go ahead and try to use this basic and intermediate as being 400 students. So if I have basic and intermediate being equal to 400, I know that basic and intermediate and not advanced is going to be that 400 minus 92 again. So that should be 308. So I can come in here and write in that 308 uh, going something like that. I'm going to go and grab some more information as I go in there. The number of basic, um, for example, right, was 824. So the people who passed uh, just uh, who passed the basic exam. So basic, um, oops, that's the wrong one. That's good. And I want and basic was 820, um, 824 is what I think we had on there. So 824. And I know that that 824 will help me get um, that portion of the basic that on my Venn diagram has not yet been expressed. And what is that? Well, that is basic and not the intermediate, so intermediate complement, and not the advanced, right? So that's going to be the 824, and we can just see it right off of there. That's going to be minus 308, minus 92, minus 16. We could indicate the probabilities there, but really not a, not a terribly important um, set there. So I'm going to go ahead and just write it out. If I do that subtraction, I get 408. So we'll have 408 sitting over here. Continuing with this. I'm just going to manage this information a little bit again. Intermediates um, are sitting there at 527. So I'm going to use that intermediate at being 527. So we know the number of intermediates is 527. And from that, right, I know that if I was going to look at intermediate intersected that you also did not pass the basic and you did not pass the, the advanced. That's going to be that 527. And then we need to subtract from that the 308 and subtract off the 92 and subtract off the 25. All those other parts that are a part of I, right, that we'd already pre-computed. If I go ahead and do all of those calculations, I'm going to get in this particular case 102. So getting some new numbers here. These are not numbers that were originally given. We're calculating them and we're calculating them with the aid of this diagram. The last little bit of information that was given initially had to do with the number who uh, passed the advanced. That was 134. So I'm going to go ahead and work with that as well. So I know advanced uh, gave us 134 in there. And if I look at that advanced group, right, if I just wanted advanced but none of the other, other exams, I would have advanced and not the basic and not the intermediate. That's going to be 134 minus 92 minus 25 minus 16. We would expect this to be a small number, right? Um, if they can pass the advanced but they can't get basic or intermediate, you wouldn't expect there to be a lot there. We go through all that subtraction in there um, and you end up getting one. So there's only one person who um, by look or whatever it was um, was able to pass the advanced but nothing else. Um, okay, so
I've used all the stuff up there, but I'm still missing one group. Um, and so where does that other group come from? Well, we do know that there was something up originally that talked about the total student population. That's the thousand. That's our that's our overall universe size in this case. And so if I add up all the numbers there in the middle um, and take that from a thousand, I can get this last number. So the last number, those that didn't pass any any exam is going to be 48. And that 48 is basically a thousand, right? Minus and then we're going to have the 408 and the 308 and the 102 and the 16 and the 92 and the 25 and the 1, something along those lines. So the vast majority of students in this particular case were able to pass at least one of the one of the examination um, math examination components, basic, intermediate, or advanced. Okay, so now that I've got this Venn diagram um, with these mutually um, exclusive pieces, right? We see the eight mutually ex exclusive pieces that make up our universe. I should be able to go through and start finding the numbers um, that I need. So part A here asks for the number divide, de denied. Well, we just made that calculation. So A here, the number denied, we can easily see that on our, on our, on our chart here, that, that number denied, that number denied, is equal to 48. And we could support that with the calculations above if I wanted to, um, but I think at this point um, it's pretty good. And we do know that that is what? That is like um, not the basic exam and not the intermediate exam and not the advanced exam as far as total numbers, something along those lines. The second thing that was asked for in here, B, was the number provisional. If we go back to what our definition of provisional was, um, provisional um, admission was uh, doing that that B in there. And so um, we would like to have that um, B only uh, is, is is what that's indicating. We only got the, only got the B in there. Um, and so if I look at that particular case, um, if I just wanted the B, um, provisional admits they didn't get any other, any other um, passing um, in there as well, we could do something like this, that that provisional, right, is going to be equal to, looking at our Venn diagram, we want the provisionals, provisional, provisional here in this particular case as being B, but we're not going to have the intermediate and we're not going to have the advanced in there, right? Um, we just are, we're just only getting the, the B exam in there. And we can see that from the, from the piece here is 408 students, something along those lines. So again, the Venn just really helps me uh, manage the information and be able to answer um, these, these or compute these numbers a lot quicker. The number of normal admits in this particular case, what was a normal admit? Normal admit had both the basic and the intermediate, but would not have had the advanced um, as far as um, that. Uh, so in this particular case, I could say C, this was the normal admit, right? And that's a basic and intermediate, but we didn't get the advanced in there, right? And so if I look at basic and intermediate, but not the um, uh, advanced, that's that upper um, kind of weird piece in here. So there's basic and intermediate, but not advanced. That's 308. So we can pull that off there as well. So we can see that in this particular guy is 308. The D that we were looking for in this particular case uh, is the number that we're going to be uh, scholarship recipients. Scholarship recipients we saw had to have all three exams, and so we're going to go ahead and do that as well. So these are the number of scholarships, probably bottom line important to the institution. So number of scholarships um, that we get in here, they had to have all three. Um, that one's easy to see. That's that middle intersection right up in there. Uh, that's 92. So we know that that is that they got the basic and the intermediate and the advanced, and we got 92 out of that. The very last one that we're going to see in this one was something about um, those that required some remedial training. Remedial training, right, means that um, there's a gap somewhere um, in your math sequence up to the highest level one you did. If you only pass the basic, right, um, that's not going to be remedial, so um, that's just coming in at the basic. If you had an intermediate but not the basic, you would have to get some remediation in the basic, right? You've already shown the skills in the intermediate, but um, you weren't able to show the skills in the in the level before that, the, the basic. So um, we would need to include that. And you could also have some remediation necessary um, if you uh, tested in at an advanced level in there as well. So in this particular case, I think remediation we could do is something like this. We could say remediation, those requiring remediation, um, could be thought of as, right, 
having not the basic, but having the intermediate, right? Or we could think about having not the intermediate, but we had the advanced, um, something along those lines. So if we went ahead and identified uh, those on in this particular case as well, um, so I need not, not the basic intersected with the, the intermediate. Let's go ahead and color code these guys. So I'm going to go ahead and make this one blue. So I want B complement intersect I. B complement intersect I, right? B complement intersect I. So the I is the upper rightmost circle. B complement is everything um, outside of that. And um, if we uh, identify those two pieces. Um, I'm not sure, I'm getting that right. Yeah, B complement. So it didn't pass the B, but you did pass the I. So we're going to have anything out here, right? So these are people who passed at the intermediate level, but were not able to pass at the basic level, right? So there's some remediation necessary in there. The people who were just basic, let's do the ones that we know don't need remediation. Um, the ones who just did basic, well, that's what they come in at and they, they passed at that level. Uh, the next one over, they had both basic and intermediate. So they're gonna be going at the intermediate level, no problem there. This middle one here is the scholarship guys. They've got everything, um, no remediation necessary. Those two off on the right that were the blue, right? And those were ones who passed the intermediate. Um, but we're not able to pass the basic. And then what's the last one in here? We want the intermediate complement intersected with A. So intermediate complement intersected with A. I'm going to go ahead and go ahead and um, probably do that. Let's do that in red, just so we can get an idea of that. So the intermediate complement, anything outside of intermediate intersected with A. So it has to be an A, but outside of I. So that's going to be um, these guys sitting in there, something like that. So if you think of these two groups, um, the one who's the one, right, um, they're ready to go take uh, things that required the advanced math placement, but they didn't do anything with the basic or intermediate. So they're going to actually need remediation in both of those levels. And then that one with the 16, right, something along those lines, these were people who um, Passed the advanced, also passed the basic, but did not pass the intermediate. So they would need to take that intermediate math uh, remediation in there as well. So we can get these numbers now out of that. Um, so union in these together, um, we can clearly see this on there. It's either the, the red area or the, the, the blue areas. And we can see all the numbers that make that up. So we're going to get 1 plus 16 plus 25. So we're going to see this whole thing as being 1 plus 16 plus 25 and one more in there. And I think that was 102 plus 102 plus 102, do all of that. And what do we end up getting? We get 144. So 144 out of the 1,000 students are going to need some remediation. So this isn't kind of the classic counting like we were doing with like um, permutations or combinations, but it is an experiment. Um, it is a, a data set that includes a large number. It can be a little bit intimidating, perhaps, at first, trying to figure out how to manage that. And if we can use some of these graphical techniques that we've been discussing, um, it certainly helps us manage that, manage that data. This last um, example that I'm going to do, at least for the counting stuff, I'm going to call this example nine. Um, let's think of a pet store that happens to have a, a stock or an inventory of 10 dogs and seven cats. And what I would like to think about is, can we count the number of ways to buy two dogs and one cat? And I'm going to try to do this in a couple different ways um, and with a couple different assumptions. And we might think how these different assumptions come into play. I'm going to start by, by coming up with an event sequence. So let's look at this event sequence that is um, reflective of this idea of two dogs and one cat. I'm going to call that event sequence A, right? And I'm going to let it be one dog, then another dog, and then a cat, something along those lines. So an event sequence here, we get a dog first, and we get a dog second, and then the third thing we sell, if we were thinking about maybe um, these were all sales that were going out, um, was a cat, something along those lines. And I wanted to count the number of outcomes in number of outcomes in this event sequence A. Well, there are 10 dogs originally, so there's 10 ways to pick that first dog. Once that first dog has been removed, right, he's no longer for sale, 
um, the person who comes and buys the second uh, dog uh, of the day only has nine to choose from. So there's going to be nine dogs in there to choose. And then the very last person chooses from the cats and they were full full at the time with a total number of seven. So if I go ahead and do that, that's just a, a product rule. I can go ahead and get a total of 630 outcomes that are equivalent, right, or possible for this event sequence A. Now, we also know that not every group of people that comes into the store is going to start with a dog and then another dog and a cat to where the final end sales were two dogs and one cat. It could be a dog, cat, dog, or it could be a cat, dog, dog. So we know that there's different ways that the cat could have been ordered in there. And the person who's buying that cat absolutely cares about that sort of thing. So I would say in this case that there are, so we know there are, right? A total of three factorial over two factorial, one factorial. And that is that multinomial coefficient is one way to think about that, being equal to three reorderings, right? There are that many number of reorderings, reord, not getting the spelling on this guy too, right? So let's do that reorderings, um, right? Reorderings of our event sequence, our event sequence A, um, so that we sell, or we're looking at this event of two dogs and one cat coming out of there. So now the total um, that we might sit there and think about is that we can have the number, right, as being equal to 630 times 3 equals 890 ways, ways, right, maybe 800, 1890 ways to sell, right, or to sell, uh, to sell um, that, that, that pair of dogs and one cat, so two dogs, one cat. What are the assumptions under this? I'll do this in red. The assumptions on this is that the order and the pet, right, are important. And I think if we thought about this in terms of the people who were coming to pick up these animals, um, all of that would be um, an, an appropriate assumption in there. Um, the people who order dogs are going to want to get dogs, and they're going to want to get the dog that they ordered. And the person who gets the cat is going to want to get the cat, right, and the one cat that they ordered. And so this particular way of counted um, is, a, is a counting that respects or honors or accounts for um, order and pet type both being important. Well, there might be other ways that we could uh, consider this. Um, we could also sit there and note that a group of three things, right? So I could sit there and say, there are, we know, three factorial ways to reorder, to reorder, or maybe just to order three things, three things, right? <laughs> So if I took that total number of orderings I had, 1,890, and I divided that by that 3 factorial, I'd get 315 is equal to the number where order, right, where order is unimportant, unimportant. That order is unimportant. Um, that is maybe not such a great way of counting if you were thinking about people coming um, to the store to pick up their pet. But if I was maintaining the website for this um, for this uh, organization, I don't really care what order um, the people come in to pick up their pets. I just care that the two dogs and the one cat um, ended up uh, coming out. Okay, that those two dogs and the one cat are no longer part of the inventory. So this one might be appropriate for advertising, right? Some sort of advertising or maybe some inventory, some inventory um, kind of considerations where this one up here might be important for um, the selling, the selling to people uh, kind of way. So this goes back to this idea that you could have a very... Um, uh, basic way of describing a problem. Um, both of those kind of countings came out of this initial way of describing this. And maybe which count I'm interested in, that 1890 or this 315, depends a bit on the further application or the, um, the further um, need for it. If I had no information beyond that, I'd probably stick with the selling to people. That would seem the most uh, reasonable. By the way, there's another way I can get that 315. Go back and take a look at that original uh, event sequence um, N A. Um, so we know N A was equal to, so we'll call this another way, another way. 
Recall that we had NA, right, was being equal to 630, and that was reflected of dog one, dog two, and cat, right? But there's these two things, and the ways to reorder, reorder those dogs, right, because we're trying to get to where order doesn't matter here, is two factorial equaling two ways. So the number where order isn't important, order not important, right, would be that NA divided by 2 factorial is 630 divided by 2, which equals 315. And that is exactly what we had before. How much you think about this? Um, suppose that on a particular day, um, we sold a Great Dane, right? And we did that to a first person. And then we sold a Chihuahua. A Chihuahua, well, I don't know if I can spell Chihuahua, so let's make it a poodle. Um, so a uh, poor Chihuahua doesn't do it. It's going to be a poodle today. Uh, so we get a poodle in there. And then after that, there's just our, our cat. We don't really care what kind they are, um, something along those lines. It could have been that way to result in um, the loss of our, our Great Dane and our poodle and our cat. It could have also been poodle, right? followed by the Dane, followed by the cat. Both of those follow along this um, event sequence A, right? Where it was a dog, dog, cat. And in the order doesn't matter, we didn't really care whether that that um, Dane or Poodle um, preceded one or the other, something along those lines. Okay, so I think um, that's probably enough for these uh, initial counting kind of examples. Did a bunch last time, we, we finished them up here. Um, I also know last time we introduced a couple of ideas uh, related to independence and some re reliability problems. So um, I would like to look at a, um, an electronic switch kind of application and do some calculations based on some electronic switch configurations and the likelihood of making contact um, through these switches. This could be easily modified to um, cover basic reliability problems where instead of switches, you're just talking about probability of parts succeeding or not, something along those lines. So let's take a look at this. This combines a little bit both of independence and a little bit of that reliability um, set that we had introduced last time. I'm going to start with a point A on a circuit board, let's call it, and it's going to feed along on a wire trace, and that trace is going to branch, it's going to split, and that's going to go into a pair of switches. So I'm going to have a switch up there, and I'm going to have another switch on the lower path, and then I'm going to tie those two back together, something like that. So I'm going to have a parallel connection of two switches. I'm going to label this first one on top, switch one, the second one um, beneath it, switch two, and I'm going to allow them to have a probability of closure being equal to, I'm going to just leave it in terms of a variable P. So both of these guys, they're going to be independent switches. We'll make that um, statement here in a second. So we're going to look at configurations of independent switches. They operate independently, and whether they're open or closed is going to be modeled as a probabilistic event according to some probability. And so I give the closed probabilities here of being p, whatever p is. We know it's a number between 0 and 1. If I continue this, then I'm going to let it run into another set um, of switches that are also going to be in a parallel configuration. So I'm going to allow these guys to do something like this. And you can start imagining it would be really easy to dream up a whole bunch of different problems that would fall into these kind of, of categories. And the output of that guy is going to give me my other contact point of interest, b. Um, and I'm going to talk about these switches. I'll let the one on top be switch number three and the one on bottom be four. And I'm going to let them have a closed probability as well. And I'm going to call their closed probability something different. So I'll go ahead and give that a, a letter Q. And so Q would also be something between zero and one. So um, let all four switches, right? Let all four switches operate independently. So we have four switches operating independently. Furthermore, I'm going to let for the time being anyway. So let's go ahead and let the probability of there being a short between A and B, right, be equal to, oh, well, let's set it equal to 20%. So 20% of the time, there's going to be a short between A and B. And the other 80% of the time, um, there is not uh, going to be uh, a short. That's our desired behavior in here. So let's look at some different cases. Let's start out in A and say that if, right, Q is equal to the complement of P. So Q equals 1 minus P. 
What would that mean? That means the more likely it is for the first set of switches to close, then the less likely it is for the second set of switches to close. So we're going to let these two have complementary uh, probabilities. Um, and then I'm going to say what P, and if you know this P, you're going to get the Q then, results, results in probability of that short between those two points AB being equal to point 0.2, right? So I would like to establish the closed probability on those first two switches such that if the second two switches operate in a complementary sense, that the overall short probability of this configuration of a series of two parallel switches right, um, ends up having an overall short probability of 20%. Okay, so let's think about how we might do that. How do I get a, a short? Um, that short, that probability, is going to be what? That one is closed or two is closed. Either one of those two first ones closed allows the signal to continue, right? And we need three or four to be closed, right? Things in series both have to be true in order for it to go through. Things in parallel either have to be true for it to go through. So for me to get a short between A and B requires one or two intersected with the quantity three or four, something along those lines. And I want that whole thing to be 0 0.2, something along those lines. Okay, so I'm going to have um, some work to do here. I'm going to begin looking at that left-hand side, and I've got a probability of one or two intersected with three or four. But what do I know about intersection probabilities? If the things being intersected are independent, I can do that as a product of probabilities, right? And I know that these switches are all independent. So one or two is going to be independent of three or four. So I can get out of this just from our independence assumption to begin with. This thing is equal to probability of one or two, right, times the probability of three or four something along those lines, because an intersection between independent things gives us just their product probabilities. Now, we also know um, that a union of two pieces, right, is the individual probabilities added together if they were mutually exclusive. And if they aren't, and these are not mutually exclusive, most likely, right? And so and if they're not, we'd have to subtract off their intersection probability. So if I take something like this, I know from our previous um, discussions of, of both the axioms and consequences of axioms of probability, that that guy is the probability of one plus the probability of two minus the probability of one intersected with two. Same sort of an idea then is going to be for the next piece, and it's just going to be a, a, a multiply um, going on in here. That's going to be a probability of three, right? And I'm going to have plus probability of four, and I'm going to subtract off the probability of three intersect four. Okay, so we know how to handle unions. Um, for any uh, kind of events, um, whether they intersect or not, whether they're, whether they're disjoint or not. So looking back at the top then, what's the probability of one being, being closed? That was my P, right? So I'm going to get here a P, and the other one, same kind of switch, also has a closed probability P, and then I subtract off the probability that they're both closed. But those guys are independent, right? So those guys are independent. So their intersection probability is just a product of their two individual probabilities. So that's going to be P times P. The next one is not in terms of P. It's going to be in terms of Q. But I've made an initial assumption up here that that was equal to 1 minus P. So let's just get this whole thing in terms of P. That's going to be 1 minus P, which is Q, plus 1 minus P for the next one. And again, for the same reasons that those are independent, I'm going to get a 1 minus P squared, something along those lines. So here I have kind of a big mess of stuff. If I wanted to go through and clean that up a little bit more, this first part is going to be a 2p minus p squared. And that's going to get multiplied, if you go through all the math on that, as a 1 minus p squared. It cleans up pretty nice. Um, and if I multiply those two together then and set it equal to the point q, which is desired, what I end up with is being a p to the fourth minus a, whoops, let me bring my tools back up, do a little erase here. So I'm going to have p to the fourth, and then I'm going to have a minus 2p cubed minus p squared plus 2p, and that has to be equal to 0 0.2. 
So I've got um, an equation, one equation, one unknown. I should be able to solve it. Here's the way that I would solve this guy. I would rewrite it as a single polynomial um, and set the whole thing equal to zero. So I could look at this as a one times p to the fourth minus two times p cubed minus one times p squared plus two times p. And then I have a minus 0 0.2 being equal to zero. So this is a polynomial expression. It's a fourth order polynomial. And what I want is I want the roots of this polynomial. But it's fourth order. That's a little bit more than I want to do by hand. So I'm going to go off to MATLAB, and MATLAB provides a nice build candin function for carrying out the roots of polynomials. So in MATLAB, with its roots command, with the roots command, I can do the following. I can find the roots of that guy by saying, what are the roots of a polynomial whose coefficients are 1, minus 2, minus 1, 2, minus 0 0.2, something like that. And if I do that and set that whole thing equal to my candidate P's, um, MATLAB would return. So let's go ahead and give myself a MATLAB prompt, something like this. MATLAB would respond in this particular case. It would respond by saying, hey, P calculated in this way is going to be equal to, and it gives us 2.0315. It gives us minus 1.0315. It gives us 0 0.8931, and it gives us 0 0.1069. So I think we have a little more to do on this uh, to probably uh, make some sense out of this. First thing I know is that probabilities have to be between 0 and 1. So even though this satisfies the overall um, equation, it does not satisfy the basic requirements of a valid probability. I'm going to exclude it from consideration. Same thing with the other. Not only is it not of size um, in, in 1 or less, it's also a negative probability, which means nothing. The other two are possible probabilities. So using a closed probability p being equal to 0 0.8, 8931 works, or using a closed probability for my first set of switches equaling to 0 0.1069 um, would also work. I'd like to think just a little bit more about these two choices and why maybe these two choices are also themselves um, uh, very understandable, especially one in terms of the other. Remember, P is just the closed probability of the first pair of switches. The next one, Q, is equal to 1 minus P. And what is that in this first case? It's 0 0.1069. And the one in the other case is q equaling 1 minus p being 0 0.8931. We're getting really the same pair of probabilities, right? It's just in one case, the switch that has the higher closed probability of 89% comes before the set of switches that have the lower probability of about 10%. Or you could swap that. You could have the lower probability switches first, followed by the higher ones later. We can look at that original diagram in here. It really shouldn't matter which order those two guys were in there, right? If I swap those two orders, I need both of them satisfied, satisfied to get the, the short through. It shouldn't matter which order those two go in there. So whether P was the smaller value or the larger value, in this particular case, shouldn't matter. So hopefully that clarifies part of the reason why we get the two values we do and make sense that one is the complement of the other and why it is that. Okay, so let's continue doing some, some additional type of calculations. How about this? Suppose we change the problem just slightly, and I sit there and I say, if now instead Q is equal to P, so instead of having that second set of switches operate um, in a complementary way to the first set, so if that first part A, um, as one switch's um, likelihood of shutting got, got higher, the other one got lower, um, what happens if they all operate with the same probability? So I've got four identical ones. So if Q equals P, what is the P, right, to give the little p to give probability of that short right between a and b being equal to 0.2 again so that's the one we want to do well if we go back up to what we had originally uh, we had seen what that first piece was it was modeled by 2p minus p squared so that analysis is the same um, and it's just now the second piece is exactly like that. So we're going to get 0 0.2 being equal to, in this particular case, just take that 2p minus p squared, right? And the second one, we're just going to duplicate that again. Instead of 
instead of changing it as q's, which is going to be p because p is equal to q. So I'm going to get a 2p minus p squared. Um, don't have to go through a bunch more stuff in there. I just have to, to carry out that polynomial multiplication. And that's going to be a p to the fourth minus 4p cubed, right, plus a 4p squared. Again, I can rewrite that as a p to the fourth minus 4p cubed plus 4p squared um, plus, nope, it's going to be minus when I bring it to the other side, minus 0 0.2, equaling to 0. And if I in MATLAB say p equals the roots command of this, although in this case you, you um, um, yeah, I think it's still fourth order. You're going to need some help on it most likely. So I'm going to do that roots command in here, and I'm going to have what? I'm going to have a 1, and so that's the fourth uh power is a coefficient, and I'm going to have a minus 4 and a 4. There is no p term, so I need to put a 0 in there, and it's really important that I remember that 0, or else I'm going to get a wrong answer here. And then I would end it out with that, with that minus 0.2. If I do that in MATLAB, right, if I do that as a MATLAB thing, MATLAB comes back and it gives me the values. Remember, the number of roots equals the order of the polynomial, so I should be getting four values out of here, and it gives me 2.203. It gives me 1.7435. It gives me 0 0.2565, and it gives me minus 0 0.2030. And again, in this particular case, that's not a valid probability, that's not a valid probability, and that's not a valid probability. There's only one valid probability. There's only one way where I have four identical switches, um, all with closed probability P, that I can get with that particular configuration of the switches a overall short probability equaling to 20%. And so in that particular case, it's a unique answer, P equals 0 0.2565, something like that. Okay, let's do two variants of our A and B and see where those guys get us. So for this next one, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to maintain the configuration um, and assumptions of A. So um, like part A, we're going to assume, right, that Q is the complementary probability, 1 minus P. But now what I would like to do is I'd like to find, I would like to select, I would like to select P such that, such that, the probability of a short between A and B is maximized. And I'd like to know what that maximum is, right? I'd like to maximize that probability of short. So this is a little bit different, right? If we go back and take a look at this picture, I've got my switches configured. Um, if I wanted to just maximize the likelihood of a short through this first part, right, because both both switches are the same, I would just make P equal to 1, right? 100% of the time it would be closed. And that means 100% of the time you're getting through that first section. That hurts us though in this next section because they're the complementary ones. So if the first ones were working with 100% and these guys are working with a complement, right? Um, 0%, nothing will ever get through. And we've already seen a case before, in A before, we saw at least 20% was possible. So certainly, you know, maximizing the short probability through the first part does not give us an overall maximization of the short probability. So how can we do this? Well, we can go back to our calculus, and we know that we can maximize according to a particular um, parameter or variable, right? Um, we can find that max by doing a derivative test. So I'm going to revisit what the probability, right? Um, of our short was, our probability of a short, right, between A and B from A, we could say this from, uh, let's get this so we can read it, from A, right, from A, the probability of a short between A and B was equal to what? That was equal to, we had a P to the fourth minus 2P cubed minus P squared plus 2P. So to maximize this guy, I'm going to look at what the derivative with respect to that parameter is of this p short ab, right? And we're going to set it equal to 0. That's going to find us a, a point of either max or min. So we would have to check it and find out whether it was a max or a min. But um, let's go ahead and do that. So the derivative of this guy is just going to be something like a, um, in this particular case, 4p cubed right? Then I'm going to have a minus 6p squared minus 2p plus 2. Set it equal to 0. That finds that point of max or min, right? And I'm again going to have to find the, the roots to this. So I'll use um, MATLAB to find the roots of that particular polynomial. So I'm going to look at whatever the roots 
of a polynomial with coefficients 4, minus 6, minus 2, and 2. And MATLAB will come back and it spits out the values of 1.618, 0 0.5, and minus 0 0.618 something along those lines. Again, um, just because these satisfy that polynomial expression, they don't necessarily satisfy all of our requirements for valid probabilities. That's a probability greater than one. That's a probability less than one. They're both un, un, unplausible or not possible as probabilities, but the middle one works out just fine, and we see it's right there in the middle. So p equaling 0 0.5 maximizes, maximizes the probability that there's a short, right, between A and B, right, um, if we had Q equaling 1 minus P, complementary ones. In other words, we go back to our figure up here and we take a look at it. I can think about, I'm going to increase P, and that causes Q to decrease, and we're getting them to come to a balance point where they're sitting equal to one another, and that happens to give us this max. Probably to be um, totally uh, careful here, you would need to verify. You probably want to verify. You want to verify it's a max. Verify it's a max. You can do that through a second derivative test. You can also check the boundaries. Um, we are trying to, to find an optimal solution on an interval, so you should always be checking boundaries. So I'm going to do it through a boundary check. So I'm going to check at the boundaries. I'm going to check at the boundaries, and so the boundaries are p equaling 0, so at p equaling 0. We know, because we'd already seen this, the probability of a short was equal to 0. And I know that at p equaling 1, the probability of the short right, was equal to 0. Um, that just reverses the role of the first and the second stages, both of those guys. And so that p equaling 0 0.5, we'd already seen a value set in there that gave us a 20% short probability, right? Um, and so that one in the middle there must be a max because that probability um, ends up with a probability of that short being greater than 0. So we've got something at 0, something at 0, and some kind of point whose derivative is 0, right, happening that's at a value greater than 0. So we do know it is a max, and it's sort of a sensible one. That makes sense with those complementary um, probabilities. One last one that we will do here, and I think this one will be super obvious as well, but it's just worth it again, and it will help us again uh, maybe emphasize that need for checking edges and boundaries. Um, so let's do D, what P, right, maximizes, maximizes the probability of a short between A and B, right, for the conditions in part B, which is to say that P equals Q. Again, I know that the probability of a short, we'd already computed that before, was equal to P to the fourth minus 4P cubed, right, plus 4P squared. I can apply the first derivative test on that. So differentiate with respect to P, that probability of a short, something along those lines, and that's going to be a 4P cubed minus 12p squared, right, whoops, plus 8p, and that has to be equal to 0. I can solve that with MATLAB, and it gives us p equaling 0, 1, and 2. A cubic, right, has three three results, and so it turns out 0, 1, and 2 are the, are the solutions here. 2 can be excluded. 2 is not a valid probability, but 0 and 1 are, and they also happen to align at the boundaries. But what do I know about a probability of zero? Probability of zero means you never close the thing. And so the probability of a short is zero. So for this guy, probability of the short, right, equals zero. So that's a min. This derivative test found a minimum on, on that particular one. This one gives me a probability of a short being equal to one. That's a maximum. So that's going to be a max. So we will use p equal to 1 to maximize that short probability. And if we go back up here, this is one that is, again, just super, super obvious. If q is equal to p, if q is equal to p, saying that this guy closes with 100% probability, that means close it, close it, close it, close it. Clearly, we are going to be closed 100% of the time. You can't get better than 100%, right? So um, 
that's a that's another example of doing some of these reliability problems. This set of examples combined two types of concepts, right? It combined that idea of independence, and it also combined that idea of 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 reliability. So having things in series or having things in in parallel and working with those. Um, we've had a couple of long lectures um, in the past, so I'm going to make up for it with this one by having it just a little bit shorter. It's also a good breaking point. Um, we're right at that boundary of getting into Chapter 3 where we talk discrete random variables. So we will pick up next lecture with um, discrete random variables.